Good morning. <laughs> Jay Baba. So my story uh, with Amaya Baba probably began way before I ever heard his name. May before this lifetime. So I was born in Boston, a Catholic family, a loving father, a mother who was ill, not super religious. Um, they tried to say the rosary every night, my mother did, but the kids wouldn't have it. So that didn't go over so good. The thing with my father <clears throat> was he said his prayers every morning and night. So that made a deep impression on me as a child. You could see him on his knees. And uh, My mother was ill, she didn't go to church. So I didn't have a lot of support to be a religious person early. However, I loved the church and I loved the saints. Um, couldn't read enough of them, couldn't have enough statues, couldn't have enough lights. I loved every bit of it. And of course I was destined to be a nun, my mother thought. So I did like the nuns, but I had a little problem with a priest. And um, I began to ask questions when I was around 12 or 13. I think it had something, as I remember, it had something to do with children that are born that are not baptized and they go to a place called purgatory. So that, that just, I couldn't put that together in my head. So that was kind of a breach there that <clears throat> sort of began my search at a young age. And I was drawn, like in the beginning of college, um, drawn to study world religions, was interested in Buddhism, liked anybody that was different than my own background. Um, so I was exposed to a lot of different people in different areas of study. So the Theosophists, the Jungians, uh, Gurdjieff, and I was, when I was married, I was pretty well connected to those folks. And I used to go with my husband, uh, who was a tag-along, but uh, I think in the long run he, he was probably pretty <laughs> advanced. <laughs> but anyway, he was a tag-along, and, um, and he liked what he heard. And it was almost a street person who was speaking. It was in Hartford, Connecticut. It was probably 1974. And it seemed at that time there were a lot of the gurus coming into the east, to the west, from the east. And for some reason they went through his platform. He called it the Philosopher's Open Forum. And so Satyadananda, um, I'm trying to think of some of Yogi Bhajan, I'm trying to think of some of the folks that came through that spoke. And one time, a woman came through, and her name was uh, Nadine Klagern. And she had just come back from India. I was very attracted to her. And <clears throat> her story, she found her guru in the south of India. And she was a teacher of God Speaks in Manchester Community College, right outside of Hartford, Connecticut. Now that was the first time I had heard Maya Baba's name when she mentioned that book. She might not have even mentioned his name then, but she mentioned she was teaching Planes of Consciousness was the name of her course study. And she didn't, she really just talked about her experience that night, but I was so drawn to her, I asked her if she would come to my home and speak to some friends of mine and tell us more about the, the uh, stages of consciousness. Uh, she came a couple of times and then she, she was a serious person. But she wasn't in it for fun and she said that she wouldn't be back again because people were more interested in the desserts and the tea than what she had to offer. And of course she came in with charts and the book and 
<clears throat> so, but I kept a relationship with her. She gave me a book to read about her master. I was not drawn to it. I was a little repulsed by it. And um, she said, I know that you're not interested in my line. Um, she said, but you might like to read uh, The Discourses by Mayor Baba. And um, she said, I don't know who he is. I've heard he's a Sufi saint. So because I respected her so much, I ran out and got the discourses. And that was when it all began. And I know other people, they feel very close to that book, or to maybe any book. But that particular book, I've heard people say, as I felt that I had actually written the book. It felt so dear to me, so close to my heart, and I just gave a big sigh, ha, ah, I'm here. So in that book somewhere, I think it, it said you needed to have a spiritual ma a, a living spiritual master. I found that a little confusing, and so I went on a search. And I was a little whacked out at that time. I had, had five children, the last one in 1969, and my behavior changed. I withdrew. I didn't want to be with people. I cast friends away. Um, my behavior was much different. I was on a search, and I, thinking back, it was probably postpartum depression that it was. Um, but anyway, um, that was uh, 1969 when um, my behavior changed. So uh, then a divorce happened, not some years later. But I was on this search. I was looking for Christ on the street. and. Um, I went to one of these meetings of some of this group in, uh, in the Hartford area and I heard a conversation outside. A man said, whispered to the group that he was in, have you heard that someone's here with the consciousness of Mayor Baba? And I just flew over to him. I knew him because he was a scientist, he was doing a study on afterlife experiences. Um, I think something like that. And I said, boys, um, who is this person? I want to meet him. And, and he was so busy in his conversation that he didn't really give me any time. And then I found his phone number and started to pester him. And he knew a person that was involved with that little group. It was a very small group. Um, eventually, to keep the story short, uh, eventually, in time, I did meet this person, as well as my husband at the time. And um, uh, I, I felt that uh, he was advanced in some way. He had experiences that I have not had. And... Um, my husband felt he was the Christ. He felt very, very deeply with him. That's why I say he was a tag-along, but he had recognition powers of other people. So um, he, to he told me to read three books. One was The Avatar. One was The Baba's Everything and the Nothing. And the other one was Cahil Gibran's um, Jesus, the Son of Man. And uh, of course I was so delighted, I was thrilled. There's a small group of about eight or nine people, young people. Um, they used to study the discourses at night. Uh, his main person, well, female person, came down and met Elizabeth. And she came down with a requ request to have permission to have a bookstore. Uh, in the Hartford area, under their auspices, which they call Truth for Spiritual Awakening. Um, Elizabeth did not give her the go-ahead for that. However, she gave her a personal book of God Speak, signed by Mayor Baba. So, in time, I felt that I was being pushed. There wasn't a 
there wasn't a connection that could keep me going in the group. And so years later I asked and she said, um, met that woman and, and she said that we called him Baba, that Baba knew at the time that you belonged with Mayor Baba. So he never encouraged any um, intimacy of any way, knowing how difficult it would be to break away. So um, from there, um, the divorce, and um, for whatever reason the divorce was, it seemed to be a good thing. Um, I didn't want to meet any Baba people. I didn't want to hear any stories. I wanted to have my own story. And I had heard so many stories from so many groups of all their experiences. And so it was about 10 years later that I um, went to California, met Kitty, Bauji, Phyllis, and then went to India. And, and so it's the journey. We're on the journey. Something ignites your heart and tells you this is it. There's, there is no more than this, and now just try to live accordingly a natural life. So that's my story. So you lived in India for seven years? I you? did. I lived there as a part time resident from 85 to 94, and then I lived full-time for two years, 94 to 96. I was going to live there forever, got rid of everything, and, um, and didn't, felt I needed to come back. It's all in his hands, but you think you're figuring things out. Interesting thing happened on my first trip over there. I met a group at the Bombay airport and they said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Mayor Baba's place. I was traveling alone. And they said, they were German, I think. I'm not quite sure. And uh, they were from Europe. And they said, no, 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 no. You're not going to the right place. You have to come with us. We're going to the South Indian guru. And you have to have a living master. So come with us. And I said, I'm sorry. I have come so far. I'm going. <laughs> So Erich enjoyed that story. So it's kind of like putting you to the test uh, right off the bat. Yeah. What was it like living there? Intense, but in a positive way. I mean, you're really your only distractions are your thoughts because uh, it is so intense there, Baba's pictures everywhere, the samadhi, is, everything is Baba, Baba, Baba. And, you know, in many ways it's much easier to live there as a Baba person if you can tolerate the heat and the bacteria and the smog. And, you know, for me it was always a little low-grade fever and a uh, little stomach stuff. I couldn't seem to keep my energy up. I didn't have a lot of uh, contact like many Westerners do. You know, they work out their place to be there, which you have to do, like you do here. Uh, you find the place where you are and where you can work. Um, my job was a receptionist. Um, dusting the books in the library, helping with the laundry, and um, going to the samadhi twice a day, uh, helping with physical therapy, although that was not my main position. My main position was the receptionist. Shelley was the physical therapist that helped out on both ends, Maribad and Marizad. So, I lived a Spartan life, which seemed to agree with me, which was probably an old nun uh, sanskara, so that was very easy for me to live that way. I liked the confinement of the single room and the simplification of everything, because the meals were provided. Um, I found my experience 
was very, very, very limited socially. I felt for myself there was no social life there, and and that that was appealing to me. I I didn't miss that. We would sit in my experience at the Savages and not say a word. Westerners not say a word unless it was, why isn't the sugar here? Who stole the sugar? You know. So simple things like that. Uh, never got too deep in my experience. Now I'm sure other people have a different experience of that. But with the heat and everything I found I did my chores and then I rested. And and there was always, there was the movie, you walked up to do, go to the movie, there was the bus trips to to meet with the Mondeley, which were exhausting. Um, between the bus trip, the crowd, and all of that different kind of energy, whatever that is, that happens around his place there. So, um, coming here, I find a very similar intensity. You can make it like it is in India. You can choose to do that and keep it Spartan. Um, or you can also, there's so much social activity here that if that's in your stuff, that, that has to be your experience, um, that's also available. I didn't find it available in India. We were working under the auspices of the trust. We, in a way, belonged to the trust. We had curfews. Uh, we had to report in, report out. Um, we didn't just get on a bus and go to town. Um, they were responsible for us. So as foreigners too, so that was also tricky for them to make sure who they had there. It was a wonderful experience. My heart, I feel, is there all the time. It never really left. Um, and trying to live this life best I can with his principles. Yeah, which the main one, as I reflect, uh, is self-effacement. Seems everything else comes comes around that. You, know, you don't have to get too complicated. Mm -hmm. Just kind of watch yourself and, and be aware. And be honest about it <laughs> when you lose it. <laughs> yeah. Priceless experience. I would go over every year, I came back. I lived in a room in Las Vegas. I'd work my head off and uh, always had work as a physical therapist, and bingo, back over again. So it was back and forth. And eventually my head got um, very unclear. I felt very unbalanced. I was in an Eastern culture and I was in a Western culture and I was finding hard time ma making that happen well in either direction. So I felt I needed to make a decision, and I made it to live in India. Mm -hmm. Here I am. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. Think it was to, the right decision. <laughs> oh, yeah. absolutely! It's wonderful to be this age and to reflect back and see the perfection of it. Yeah. And I'm blessed with work, and I was blessed to work with the Mandali in that capacity, um, in terms of physical therapy, and eventually in terms of Feldenkrais work. Uh, so when you do body work, there's no more lovely intimacy than two nervous systems. In our business, we say dancing together. That was, that was a real blessing, yeah. To see their humanity and their 100% dedication, yeah. Quite an example, and that it's possible.
Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Jerry Parker.